Before we get into this video, I want to include a content warning for detailed discussions of fat phobia, as well as mentions of fat phobic language and racism. If these things upset you, I recommend skipping this one. I've always loved performing. I'm pretty sure I've been singing as long as I've been speaking. My first Halloween costume that I can remember was Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz, and I sang Somewhere Over the Rainbow for every house we went to. As a child, I absolutely loved my voice, and I took every opportunity that I could to sing. I was in choir, school musicals, and even managed to convince my parents to sign me up for voice lessons. I wanted to be a Broadway star. I've also always been fat. I was often bullied for my weight in school. I remember a group of boys who all asked me out as a joke because obviously I was ugly and undesirable. I'm pretty sure I started my first diet as early as 12 years old. Now, in an ideal world, these two facts about me would have nothing to do with each other. But unfortunately, that's not the case. While I remember how much I had adored singing in my high school musicals. I also remember being told that I was not cast in my school's production of South Pacific because even though I was a wonderful singer, all the girls in the ensemble were going to have to wear bathing suits on stage and obviously I couldn't do that. As a result of body shaming, I was made to feel so uncomfortable dancing that I was never confident moving on stage. It was clear that the world of musical theater did not have a place for me. At the same time, my voice was developing in a manner that wasn't really suited for musical theater either. I've always been loud, but my voice was becoming fuller. I started to have a vibrato that wasn't right for Broadway, but just might fit perfectly in an opera house. And just like that, I had figured it out. Opera was the place for me. I mean, when you think of an opera singer, you probably think of someone who looks like me wearing a hat with horns and singing impossibly loud high notes over a massive orchestra. Opera is built around storytelling through song. It has the ability to touch our hearts and move our souls with the athleticism, beauty, and sheer power of the human voice. Any singer with the right instrument and dedication to their vocal technique can succeed in this industry because, after all, opera is all about the voice. Or at least that's the way it seems to be perceived by the outside world. Friends, let's talk about fat phobia and opera. Part 1. The History of Fat Phobia so before we dive into the, our discussion of fat phobia, I want to establish a few things. First off, I use the word fat when describing myself as opposed to plus size or curvy or some other euphemism for fatness. I understand people's discomfort with the word as it's often used to mean lazy or ugly or gluttonous. However, fat is not an inherently negative quality. It's simply a physical descriptor. So it's the word I'll continue to use throughout this video. Secondly, I want to establish that these issues are intersectional, and while being fat has made the opera industry a difficult place for me to be, I understand that I'm still in a position of privilege. The experience I have as a size 20 white woman is going to be very different than the experience of a woman of color who's a size 32. Along those lines, it's also essential to establish that fat phobia is rooted in racism. In the Renaissance, fatness was not considered to be a negative trait. In fact, in Agnolo Firenzuela's 1541 treatise on female beauty, on the beauty of women, he describes the ideal woman as being proportionate and voluptuous, even going so far as to say that thinness is evidence of bad habits of the body. He also stated that even women who were quite fat could achieve the heights of beauty. When the slave trade began, African women were initially praised for the beauty of their bodies. However, the dialogue quickly shifted from praise to describing them as little, low, and foul. You can find evidence of this in Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream, where Hermia is described as an Ethiop and a tawny tartar, as Helena and Lysander insult her, calling her low, little, and a dwarf. As the transatlantic slave trade reached its peak, racial scientists, 
aka white supremacists of the 18th century, began establishing racial classifications. These scientists sought to establish fundamental physical differences between Europeans and non-Europeans with an emphasis on women to serve as proof of European superiority. Comte de Buffon wrote in his 1749 book, Natural History, General and Particular, in the chapter On the Varieties of the Human Species, that the stereotype of Africans being little and low was false and that they were actually tall and plump. He claimed that their fatness was a result of living in a place where food was readily available so they could stay nourished without much effort, stating that they were well-fed, but simple and stupid. In 1774, Edward Long wrote that Africans have no morals, no taste but for women, gormandizing, and drinking to excess, and wish to be idle. These French and English philosophers solidified the association between fatness, poor morals, gluttony, and blackness. If you're interested in researching this topic further, I highly recommend Fearing the Black Body, The Racial Origins of Fat Phobia by Sabrina Strings. It was crucial in my research for this project and really expanded my understanding of these societally ingrained biases. These stereotypes were further enforced by puritanical religious fanatics. Notably, English Dr. George Chain stated that fatness was a result of living for sensual pleasures, which God does not condone. He advised a diet of milk with seeds, bread, mealy roots, and fruit, advertising it as a miracle cure for both the body and the soul. In a 1734 letter to the Countess of Hastings, he even encouraged vomiting or purging as a regular part of one's diet. It's worth noting that his clientele was predominantly women. Our good old friend Shakespeare hated fat people too. His character, Falstaff, the bumbling fat knight, serves as an example of how this revered playwright perceived fatness to be linked with ill morals, laziness, stupidity, and gluttony. White Anglo-Saxon Protestant American magazine editor Sarah Hale praised slimness as the result of Christian temperance in food and drink and evidence of racial superiority. In 1836, an article was published in the women's magazine she edited, Godey's Ladies Book, which claimed that the only place fat women could be found attractive was under the African sun. The slender silhouette of the Gibson girl was considered to be the ideal of beauty in American women. The idea of a universal, normal weight didn't even originate from the medical field. The concept was introduced by the standard tables of heights and weights released by the Metropolitan Life Health Insurance Company in 1912. Their data came from a survey of insurance policyholders which contained twice as many men as women and absolutely no people of color. This data was then widely embraced by doctors and eugenicists alike. Tragically, negative stereotypes surrounding fatness still affect fat people, especially fat people of color. A 2010 qualitative review of studies on weight stigma showed fat people are generally considered to be less efficient and successful and less suitable to leadership positions. They are perceived to have more interpersonal problems and to be less motivated, less intelligent, less reliable, less organized, and less disciplined. A similar review done in 2018 found that weight stigma was associated with irregular eating, higher rates of anxiety and depression, and low self-esteem. While the average American dress size is a 16 to 18, most clothing stores only carry up to a size 12 or 14 or an extra large. Many public spaces are inaccessible to fat people. I've had to request a seatbelt extender on airplanes multiple times, and I cannot even begin to describe how humiliating it is to have to tell a flight attendant that the seatbelt that's provided is too small for me. And of course, we cannot forget about diet companies who have built an entire industry off of people's fear and hatred of fatness that brings in $72 billion per year. But that's a whole other video on its own. So how is opera, the art form renowned for its fat ladies who sing, affected by fat phobia? In more ways than you might imagine. Let's get into it. Part two. How fat phobia affects opera. We'll start with an obvious one, casting. There's a, let's say misconception that fat people are not believable as romantic leads. I was once told by a colleague that quote, 
Nobody wants to see two fatties fall in love. They then proceeded to encourage me to lose weight if I was serious about my career. There's also this widespread idea that because the Metropolitan Opera does these live broadcasts where cameras get close up shots of the singers that houses now have to cast for live in HD, which is really just coded language for only cast people in smaller bodies because that's what's perceived to look good on camera. The reality is a majority of houses don't have the capability to produce broadcasts at this scale. And even if they did, Fat people can appear on camera singing and looking gorgeous. And for those who claim that fat people are not convincing as romantic leads, I would like to remind you that fat people are loved and fall in love. We do not all spend our lives striving for that magical moment when we're skinny and therefore worthy of a relationship and love. There are many of us who are actively enjoying our lives and our bodies as they are, and that includes being in relationships. Keeping us out of romantic roles just prevents talented people who are also fat from being on stage and perpetuates the idea that we are unattractive and unfit for love. Restricting fat singers to parental or comedic roles forces us to be perceived as these limited character types both on and off stage. Fun fact, according to Opera Base, Verdi's opera Falstaff, based around Shakespeare's mean-spirited caricature of fatness, was performed 115 times in 2019, making it the 37th most performed opera of that year worldwide. The fact that this industry still considers that kind of fatphobic material to be so acceptable is pretty telling. I've sung Alice Ford before, and... I cannot explain how bizarre and uncomfortable it was for me to realize that I was playing a character who spends a good portion of the show mocking a fat man for how lazy, stupid, and undesirable he is. Then there are the issues surrounding costuming. There is, of course, the well-known little black dress incident involving Deborah Voigt. In 2004, she was told that she would not fit into the little black dress or the modern aesthetic of the Royal Opera House's new production of Ariadne of Naxos, and her contract was cancelled. It's certainly been suggested to me before that perhaps one of the reasons I don't get cast more often is because companies don't have any costumes that would fit me. Recently, there was also the story of Melanie Spector, published by the Middle Class Artist. When Melanie was only eight years old, she was told by the Metropolitan Opera Children's Chorus director, Elena Doria, that she would need to lose weight to be cast because she wouldn't fit into any of the Met's costumes. I do understand that it is more expensive to costume fat bodies, but that is not an excuse for cruelty. Also, spoiler alert, the Metropolitan Opera is the largest opera house in the country and... While smaller regional theaters may not have extensive costume budgets, the Met absolutely has the resources to costume anyone they want to. Unfortunately, it is very common to encounter costumers who are either unable or unwilling to dress fat bodies appropriately. The first opera I was ever in, I was a member of the chorus. Uh, while my costumes were absolutely beautiful, the costumers insisted on putting me in Spanx tights with a control top. Now, every singer has their preferences, but I personally hate having my stomach compressed when I sing because of the way it affects my breathing. At the time, I was young and unwilling to speak up for my needs, but I was extremely uncomfortable. In the first dress rehearsal, I accidentally bumped into a rough edge of scenery and ripped the tights. I let the costume department know, and one of the costumers decided that they needed to come into the communal dressing room afterwards and berate me. They told me that they only had one more pair of those tights, and that if I ripped those, there would be no more tights in my size, and that I would have to wear a pair of tights that were a size too small. I was mortified. But wait. 
there's more because if people in positions of power aren't getting upset about how fat singers look on stage, they're concerning themselves with how singers should dress in an audition setting. Look in the closet of any young fat soprano and you will find our uniform, the three quarter length sleeve jewel tone wrap dress. And while I do love how incredible I look in royal blue, I do not love regularly being told that I need to cover my arms and choose flattering garments, which is, again, some super fun coded language for clothes which conceal my fatness. There was a recent dress code document from the Opera in the Ozark Summer Program which read, Please be considerate about the amount of skin you expose. Not everyone is comfortable with overt displays, and some people should definitely not be exposing a lot of skin. In the words of fat icon Stephanie Blythe, as a card-carrying member of some people, <laughs> it's, it's very clear who this language is directed at. Like, don't get me wrong, I understand wanting people to dress well, but at the same time, singers should be able to wear clothes which make them feel confident and comfortable in high-pressure environments like auditions or master classes. And don't even get me started on the whole requirement for shapewear and pantyhose. I don't know about y'all, but I personally find it very difficult to focus on singing when my stomach is being aggressively compressed or when I can feel my tights slowly rolling down every time I inhale. Despite these negative aspects, it has been made very clear to me in multiple instances by several different industry professionals that it is more important for me to have a smooth foundation. I even had a teacher tell me that I needed to be wearing Spanx because no one would want to be able to see me breathe. I'm sorry, but if someone's primary aesthetic concern about an opera singer is being able to see their stomach expand when they are inhaling to fuel their incredible instrument with breath, I find it hard to believe that this person is realistically considering all of the elements that go into creating beautiful sound. I also think it's important to note that a lot of these audition wear requirements are much more strict for women than for men and very deeply rooted in sexism. Finally, I want to mention what I believe to be the most common instance of fat phobia in opera and certainly the one I've experienced the most often. That is unwanted commentary on your body. This can come from directors, judges, teachers, coaches, and even colleagues. It takes the form of everything from subtly recommending weight loss tips to full on body shaming and occurs both publicly and privately. These comments are often made with good intentions. For example, let's say someone chooses to tell me that they had seen many other singers who look like me struggle to thrive in this industry as a result of being in a larger body and so they want me to lose weight so that I won't have to go through that. While I absolutely understand why someone who cares about me and who has seen this continuous shaming of fat singers might think that's helpful to say. I think it's also important to understand that by making a comment like this, they're just adding to the stigma that I already face. Asking me to fundamentally change my body to make me worthy of being heard, it's not acceptable. This type of language is extremely pervasive, deeply humiliating, and incredibly damaging to fat singers. Part three, what can we do to change it? So, what can we do to make this industry a more safe and hospitable place for fat people? First of all, the fact that you're watching this video and educating yourself on this issue is a great start. I would encourage you to take this as a chance to re-examine your biases. Consider how you think about fat people and negative personality traits you may associate with fatness. Do some research into fat phobia. I'll be including links to all my sources in the description below, as well as some additional resources on this topic and some accounts of fat singers and activists I really love. 
listen to the fat people who are speaking up on these issues and listen to what they have to say about their experience. Luckily, opera houses have the power to affect so much positive change in so many ways. The most obvious is hiring fat singers. Representation matters. I remember the first time I ever thought I could make it in this industry was seeing Jamie Barton perform. For those of you who might not know her, she's an absolutely incredible fat dramatic mezzo who is also openly bisexual. At the time, I was still a student in college, insecure, fat, and not quite out of the closet. So seeing someone like Jamie absolutely thriving and performing with confidence was incredibly meaningful to me. I'll say it again, representation matters. Not only that, there is so much fat talent in this industry. If opera companies choose to cast in a way that excludes fat bodies, they're losing out on so many gorgeous voices, so much amazing musicianship, and so many incredible contributions to this unique and beautiful art form. Now that they've hired fat singers, great. Let's make sure that there's an appropriate budget and adequate staff for costuming these performers. Let's make sure that all rehearsal and performance spaces are easily accessible with comfortable seating for all bodies, as well as accessibility and adequate seating for audience members of all sizes. Most importantly, let's make sure there are robust policies in place which create serious consequences for fatphobic behavior from Opera House employees, even when they are famous directors or conductors. However, I suspect that the majority of the people watching this video are not directors of major opera houses, but are my friends and colleagues. And if that's you, thank you. You too have so much power to create positive change. If you're someone in a normative body who witnesses an instance of fat phobia in a rehearsal or a coaching, stick up for your fat colleague. I completely understand if you don't feel safe doing that, but please at least talk to us afterwards and let us know that you don't think that's okay. Amplify the voices of your fat colleagues, especially fat people of color. When you hear other singers using fat phobic language, call them out and educate them on why it's problematic. And last but not least, take some time to rethink your own language. Remember that feeling fat should not be used as a stand-in for feeling tired, lazy, unattractive, etc. Also, remember that weight gain or loss is morally neutral and not worth the unwarranted commentary it so often receives. As for my fellow fat singers, I love you so much. You are so talented and resilient. If you feel empowered to speak up about the fat phobia you've experienced, do it. But if you're not there, I don't blame you. The fact that you even exist within this regressive and toxic industry is absolutely incredible. If I could encourage you to change one thing, I would ask that you not shy away from using the word fat to describe yourself. The more people who choose to use fat as a neutral descriptor of body type, the more it becomes detached from all the negative connotations it currently has. Finally, I just wanted to pass along a piece of advice from activist and soprano Tracy Cox on coping with and preparing for fat phobic commentary from people in positions of power. Take some time on your own to sit down and establish your artistic mission statement and clarify where your boundaries with your body lie. You can even make yourself a mental script for these fat phobic interactions. For example, if a teacher recommends that you lose weight to have a successful career and that's not something you're okay with, you can kindly but firmly establish a boundary by saying, I really appreciate your advice. I understand that you want me to succeed and I understand why you say this to me, but it does me harm when I'm stigmatized for my weight in this way. So I'm not going to talk to you about my body or any kind of weight loss. Epilogue, hope for the future. It has taken me years of work, both on my own and with help from friends, colleagues, teachers, mentors, and an amazing fitness coach. But I've been able to adjust my mindset, build a healthy relationship with food and exercise, and develop confidence in my body. But this essay isn't just about me. It's about the industry as a whole. And believe it or not, I think there's hope for that too. 
As I mentioned, I recently had the pleasure of interviewing the one and only Tracy Cox, who has been an outspoken advocate for fat singers and the fat community in general. She's also an extremely talented dramatic soprano. One of her many current projects is a chamber opera with Victory Hall Opera entitled Fat Pig. The opera features a fat woman as the romantic lead, Helen. Tracy described the first act as a funny, charming, witty, romantic comedy. The traditionally attractive male lead, Tom, meets Helen at a restaurant and falls head over heels for her. However, like many operas, the second act takes a turn for the worse. Helen meets Tom's co-workers only to find that they are filled with hatred and scorn for her because of her fat body. Tom can't take the pressure and decides to break things off with Helen. In a move of desperation, Helen begs him to stay with her. The opera concludes tragically with Helen resolving to get weight loss surgery and amputate her stomach because it's the only way she can stay in this relationship which means so much to her. While this may not sound empowering to the casual observer, I would ask you to consider a few things. Number one, the role of Helen in this work now exists as a romantic lead in the opera canon which is specifically designed for a fat woman. As Tracy described it, she felt validated knowing that she could go into the rehearsal room understanding that her fatness would not be raised as an issue, but that her body was a necessity and an asset, crucial and central to the piece. Secondly, this is a very, very real experience for so many fat people and, while it may not be heartwarming, it accurately represents how fat phobia can affect our lives and our relationships. Also, I think it's important to note that it follows a tragic opera structure. While it does depict Helen making this terrible choice, it is not portrayed as a positive thing. It leaves the audience horrified that she would choose to alter herself like this because of pressure from cruel, heartless people. This industry has the power to represent humanity in such a unique way because that's what opera is. It's this incredibly compelling art form which tells stories in a way that no other can through the athleticism, beauty, and sheer power of the human voice. Yes, the industry as it exists now is extremely conservative and regressive, but more and more people are beginning to shed light on these issues. And the more people talk about it openly, the more it becomes accepted to talk about it. The more we can move in solidarity, the more we will see this shift happen. Things are changing for the better. The fact that Fat Pig specifically centers a fat singer and a romantic lead paves the way for more new works which highlight fat talent. Step by step, we can change opera from an industry which thrives on fat phobia, stigmatizing fat bodies, and normalizing that collective trauma to an inclusive and welcoming art form which exudes a unique and powerful sensation of fat joy. Phew, that was a very intense video and I really appreciate that you've watched the entire thing. I'm going to include some lovely footage of my parents' dog and ducklings. You've earned it. While we're wrapping this thing up, I want to send a thank you to everyone who supported me in this project. It has been sitting in my brain for years and honestly, I was terrified to speak up for so long, but Seeing all these other singers come forward about the fat phobic abuse they've endured has given me courage to finish this video and speak up about my own experiences. In particular, I want to thank Tracy Cox, at Sparkle Jams on Instagram, for all the work she has done for this community and the work she continues to do. Go give her a follow. Also, a big thank you to Zach Finkelstein for giving fat singers a platform to speak on these issues. If you're a member of the opera community and you haven't read the articles on the middle class artists about this topic, you should go do that now. I'll include links in the description. Also, if you've made it this far, thank you for watching. I cannot put into words how much I love and appreciate you. I hope that you get to do something which brings joy to yourself and others today. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.